I want to welcome you into a conversation and a time of prayer uh, with myself. Uh, I'm Rusty Small, lead pastor of Liberty Baptist Church. And with me today uh, is lead pastor of the Jesus Center, uh, Robert Jackson. I have the utmost respect uh, for Robert Jackson and the ministry of the Jesus Center, which has faithfully served the Appomattox community for years. Uh, and we here at Liberty Baptist Church are doing the best that we can to serve the community. Uh, Robert and I are today going to walk through what uh, we believe are some Christian priorities to be thinking about and praying through in light of recent events. I think many Christians right now uh, just are having a hard time knowing what to say, knowing what to do, to do good in this moment. And today we're going to do the best we can to start a conversation, but to set some Christian priorities on the high ground and also not just talk about them, but ask the Lord to uh, use us in His work. So we want to talk about five major things today that will form our conversation. The first thing that we have to embrace as Christians, even in this context where the sin of racism is rearing its ugly head again in our society, we as Christians believe that the ultimate solution to human problems is the gospel. So gospel change is necessary. Uh, Robert, at least what has hit me is no matter how many structures we change in society, and we'll talk about the church's role in appropriate work in society, the first major problem as a Christian is the problem of our own heart. And the words of Jesus, if, if Jesus doesn't change us from the inside out, we, we won't be able to get the change we want from the outside in. So let's talk about the gospel and the need for gospel change in this moment. What do you have to say in that regard? I think as far as in this moment, I think um, certain incidents and this incident that has happened, transpired, within our nation, um, I think that with the gospel, we have to make sure that the gospel is just not contained just within the four walls of the building. You know, I think just like, just like you said, you know, if it starts with our hearts and it changes within our hearts, then it will cause us to go beyond the four walls into the hedges and highways and the byways and to allow people to see what the gospel really looks like what the gospel is all made of, and it's, it's love. And if we're never going out there and allow, allow the gospel to penetrate our hearts, and then from penetrating our hearts, it moves to our hands and our feet, and then we can go and show that love to people that's out, that's out there. So I think we have to do a self-introspection, uh, allow God to reveal to us things and break down some things that may, we have, made, have built up that may not be right. So that's, that's one of my point take on, on that. I, at least one of the things that has struck me is with the, with the reality of George Floyd's death, the nation is rightly outraged by a man who should not have died, did die. Maybe we could put it this way, um, a man who was innocent, died a death he didn't deserve. I've heard that story before. It's contained in the gospel. But here's the deal. We are rightly outraged that he died a death he didn't deserve, and now it is for all who put him to death ought to find justice. See, the gospel turns that whole narrative on its head the very Son of God, Jesus, came to the earth and the one who put him on the cross was all of us. And uh, 
Well, that's the first and tough reality that um, the outrage that we feel at the injustice of an innocent death, yes, there are clearly those who are guilty in our society right now, okay. But the ultimate person who is guilty of the ultimate unjust death is you and me. That's right. And that's why we have to, as our first step as a Christian, we have to say, God, I admit I'm a sinner. The first and greatest problem is in me. And God, I, by your strength, if you don't change me from the inside out, if you don't deal with me, I will never be changed. And uh, what brings about profound humility. Uh, how about I offer a prayer for that, and then we'll move to our next topic. Heavenly Father, as our nation struggles, God, we struggle because a man who should not have died, died. God, we grapple for solutions. We sometimes even wonder where you are and what you're doing. And then we see the cross. We see the ultimate innocent sufferer there. And the one who put him there is all of us. And so, God, we realize that guilt is real. But, God, we realize first and foremost that we are all guilty. And so, God, we humble ourselves. We ask for you to forgive our sins. By faith, we trust in Jesus, the very one who died for us and loved us. God, we pray. We do pray for change gospel change, a heart change, an inside-out change, you make us that you would, by your Spirit, forgive our sins and by your Spirit enable us to be more godly people, not in our strength, but in your strength. Work through us, O oh God. May your church be a place of gospel change. In Jesus' name, amen. Robert, I want you to speak to this next issue, um, the issue of appropriate justice, which we as Christians certainly affirm, but longing for ultimate justice. Um, I'll just say the church has always had its hand in some form of justice work. I know at the Jesus Center, you have done a lot of justice work. Um, I know through helping in domestic violence situations where there are innocent people who there needs to be an intervention. I know recently with the, um, the church in America has really went after sex trafficking, which is a justice issue. Um, so the church has not been a part of justice issues. And the issue of racism is a justice issue. But we also realize that ultimate justice, we, we can do it appropriately, but we're just humans. To get perfect justice, we're going to need a perfect judge. And the Bible tells us that the perfect judge is God. So you, you, tell, you, you give your thoughts on how can we work for appropriate justice right now? Well, I think that, I think it's a scripture that says that, you know, out from the throne of God comes righteousness and justice. And for us to have the justice that we need to see within locally, you know, within our state, within our country right now, we need to look to God, look to God for, for the answers. Yes, there's a lot of people who are hurting right now. There's a lot of pain and a lot of people that are angry. But we have to make sure that, as the Bible says, that, you know, it's, it's okay to be angry, but to sin not. And not to allow that anger to turn into rage. And we're responding in, in such a way that it's not bringing forth the justice that we need to see. Yes, I think that we who have voices, we need to speak. And as, as the church, by us being a fixture within our communities, 
I think it's, it starts with us for our communities that we need to be speaking and we need to be advocating for justice and going across the different boundaries that may be in place and showing, being that example, being the picture where people can see that we're not just talking about it, but we're being about it. We're not just saying this is what we're going to do, but we're actually going to do something about it. And so, you know, yes, it may cause some of us to be uncomfortable, but it must happen if we want to see true justice happen within in our communities and our country. It starts there with the church really, really looking at what, is, what has transpired, but at the same time, so not trying to pass the buck into somebody else to do it or say they, but when it starts with we. And we have to step, we at the church has to come together and say, it's time for us to really do something, being led by God and doing whatever he wants us to do to bring about the justice we need to see within our community and our country. I tell you, to many people who I have talked to as a counselor who have suffered real and horrible injustices, um, one of the greatest consolations I have been able to give them as a Christian pastor is to tell them, I will do whatever I can do for you to get appropriate justice. But I can also tell them if for some reason in this world justice is not served, one day your abuser will stand before God the judge. He won't get off. She won't get off. And uh, there, is a, there is a comfort in knowing God is judge. Robert, why don't you just offer a prayer for appropriate justice and uh, maybe a thanksgiving that God will one day bring about his justice. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you, Lord, this morning. Lord, thanking you first and foremost for just who you are. And Father, Lord, you sees and you know what's going on within our country through the communities across and abroad. And Father God, Lord, there are people that are angry, people that are in pain, people that uh, don't understand exactly what is really going on. But Father God, Lord, Lord, we need justice. And Father God, we know that you are the true righteous judge and that you can bring about the justice that we seek, the justice that needs to happen within our country. Without justice, Father God, how can we bring about healing? And so, Father God, I pray that we as the church, not just only collectively, but we as far as individuals that are connected to the church, help us, Lord, not to pass the buck or delegate it for somebody else to do what you have called for us to do. Help us, Lord, to speak and use the voice that you have given us to stand and to advocate for justice. We ask that may you lead us and that you would guide us into making the right choices and decisions that we need to make as the church. Father, I thank you and we invite you in to all of the affairs that are going on at this time. And Lord, we just ask, may your hand be upon us and that you would lead us, guide us, shield us, and protect us as we see appropriate and right justice. In Jesus' name, we pray this prayer. Amen and amen. amen. I think the third area of priorities as a Christian you know, I say the change I want to see in society ought to first be seen in me. But secondarily, the change that the church wants to see in society ought to first be seen in us. Uh, I think we have some repenting to do as a church. Um, the, the church, there is neither in the Bible says there's neither Jew or Gentile, male or female, that we're one in Christ. 
It's just a, we should be a diverse, unified body. And I think this issue is certainly race is included. Uh, but I see from where I sit a church that we need to be more about unity and diversity in Christ and less about personal preference in how we like it done. At least I can say that from the churches I know about. So how can we finally start bridging the gap between uh, what I hate to, I hate these terms, the white church, the black church, still seen in those categories. I know we need repentance. I know we need intentionality. What are your thoughts? Yeah, my thoughts, I agree with you, uh, Pastor Rusty, uh, that it first starts with uh, repentance. You know what I'm saying? Allow God to reveal to sh and show us, not just as a church as a whole, but you, we as an individual that, that's connected to the church that we're in. And so, yes, it starts with, with the individual. It starts with God invading our hearts and revealing and showing us, okay, if we want to bring about change, it has to start with you. It has to start with you as the individual if you want to see change in your, in your community. And so, you know, dealing, dealing with, with, with that um, as far as the church is going, the diversity, you know, and the unity that we're seeking after, as I said before, when we first got started, you know, the most segregated time of the week is, they say, it's on Sundays. And that should not be so. No. It should not be so. And so it's more than just we may be fellowshipping with, with one another or having a church service. It's about when are we going to go beyond the church building and lock arm in arm and be in the communities and do what God called for us to do. Be the example, model Christ for what all people can, can see. They can see that, you know what, there is, there is diversity, but within that diversity, there's unity at the, same, at the same time. But, you know, we have to seek God and allow God to reveal and show us, not where it's coming from out of, uh, out of our cell where it's man-made. We need to be, be directed by the Holy Spirit to show us and lead us and guide us exactly what to do and when to do it. Well, here's my commitment to you, and I know it's your commitment to me. Uh, we're both reasonably young, so we've got some, some time in front of us. Uh, I am certainly making a commitment. I know you've made this commitment. We're going to worship more together. We're going to fellowship more together. We just need to be in each other's lives, and we need to serve more together. And and for the simple reason is we're Christian brothers That's right. and sisters in Christ. That's right. We're part of the same family. We serve the same Lord. We have the same spirit. And uh, I'm hoping for real change in this, in this area. And not just, to be honest, not this just to be uh, a white-black issue um, here at Liberty. Uh, we this year started a Hispanic service. So I, I'm hoping for a full diversity uh, within our church. Uh, I have brothers and sisters. Um, our church has had a long-term relationship in Honduras. And those are wonderful Christian brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I pray for greater diversity and unity. I offer a prayer for this one. We'll move to the next topic. Heavenly Father, we pray for the church on earth to look like the church in heaven. God, we know that gathered around the throne in heaven is every tribe, every tongue, every nation. So God, we pray that we would find our unity in you. God, we're thankful that you did not just create us all the same God, that you have, you have put into your world rich and wonderful diversity that can be celebrated as your wonderful creativity. 
But God, may that be woven together into a tapestry of unity under the cross to reveal your glory. God, the change we want to see in society, may it happen in our churches. May the racial reconciliation that needs to happen in our nation first happen in our churches. God, may we be an example of this. In Jesus' name, amen. The fourth area uh, of ways we can think about this and pray about this is genuine love and empathy for others. There's no higher ethic in Christianity uh, than the ethic of love. Robert, how can we do this better? Both, both love and empathy. I think we have to do both. Well, I think I take a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he said that, you know, um, darkness cannot drive her darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And we know that, you know, God is, he's light and he is love. And we supposed to model and be that example in the earth. And as a church, we supposed to be that beacon of hope, especially in times like these, for people um, to look to. And so we supposed to be modeling love. You know, Jesus said that, you know, we supposed to love our, our enemies. And that can be a hard pill to swallow for, for a lot of people, especially when you f have all these mixed emotions, all these feelings, pain, um, anger, or just not really understanding, not knowing. But for us to see the result that we need to see, it can only be done with love. And that causes us to really look I mean, really look at ourselves and say, you know what? Am I really loving like Jesus wants me to love my fellow man, my fellow fellow woman, my next, my neighbor, um, my coworker? Uh, am I really displaying the love that needs to be seen? Because in times like, like these, the church should be the place that people look to in tough times like these. What are we going? What are we going to do? And what are we saying to back that up? You know, so love is the key in all of this. What we're experiencing, what we're seeing, for us to really see the result that we want to see is love. Allowing God to come in, convict our hearts, bring forth conviction. Then we can be able to go and move and, and be get it done in love. Love, oh man, love is the key because. When, if you depend upon yourself and you look, you're looking at yourself and you're saying, this is what I am not or I am weak, it's uncomfortable, love will, will make you get up and go and do what you need to do and be the example of the church. You know, I'm always moved by Jesus' empathy for people. Yeah, Jesus tells us to, to love those who are tough to love. But he just didn't tell us that. He modeled that. And the person who was hard to love was us. Because, I mean, the, the ultimate enemies of God were us. And without, without, uh, without humbling ourselves for the gospel, we'd still be enemy of God. You know, I think about Jesus' words on the cross, and this, is, this has helped me. I, I, don't, I don't pretend to understand the experience of the black community, okay? But I have, in my own life, had some bad days mm -hmm. where people have hurt me deeply, mm -hmm. um, and I've had to express love, and I've had to do that ultimately through thinking about forgiveness. It's a tough one too. But Jesus on the cross, he could look at the people that put him on the cross 
And he could say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And I think any time any of us are misguided, you know, the, the thing that always strikes me, you know, in trying to express love to people, especially the unlovable ones, which is the t- where we're, you know, there's real no, no real, Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what have you done? Nothing. You really haven't loved. Love requires loving those who are quite unlovable to, to if, if when I get it wrong and when others get it wrong, okay, God looks at me even in my, even in my mistakes and sees and looks upon me with compassion and never hate. I, that's been very powerful for me and has been enabled me to forgive people because I say, you know, this person has hurt me deeply But deep in their heart, even though they hurt me deeply, they didn't mean to hurt me deeply. They had a really good reason to hurt me deeply, but their good reason was misguided. And rather than Jesus hating that, he could see beyond the hurt Mm -hmm. to 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 the misguided quality. So, boy, love's tough. Empathy's tough. Um... Uh, why don't you offer us a prayer just on love and empathy? Let us pray. Eternal wise God, Father God, Lord, uh, we thank you, uh, Father God, for this platform and thank you, Father God, for the conversation. And Father God, here we are at this critical point and we're speaking and talking about love. Your word says that you are love. And you model that. You were the example for us to follow. And so, Father God, even though at times it is not easy to love the unlovable, it is not easy at times to forgive. But, Father God, you require us of that. Help us, Lord, to model that love in the midst of all the chaos that may be happening right now and the different feeling and mixed emotions that may people may be having right now. I pray, Father God, we as the church, that we could be the true example model of what love really is at this time and season that we're in as a country. Father God, I just pray that you, Father, would show us and reveal to us, Father God, exactly how to really love, not what we think, but Father God, what is actually really true love that can be exemplified through us. Help us, Father God, even though it may be uncomfortable, help us, Lord, to go and to show the love that needs to be displayed in this time in history of this country. Thank you, Father, for your son who was the ultimate sacrifice of what love is, that he laid his life down for us, picked it back up, and for that we may have everlasting life. That is the example of what true love. Help us, Lord, to go out and to love our brothers and our sisters, regardless of what race, color, nationality, but help us, Lord, to model what love is through your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The last priority I feel like we ought to communicate today is a local commitment to good works. I I realize if this moment in history is like any other moment in history, it will pass. And the question becomes, what's going to be on the other side of it? And if part of, what's not, if, if part of what's not on the other side of it is a renewed commitment for committed people to show up every day to do the hard work of church building and community building, we're not going to see the change we hope 
to see. Uh, I have the utmost respect for Jesus Center. You, you have led, you know, your church to to do after school tutoring, to do to to feed children five days a week. I can't that <laughs> that's that's unbelievable to me. Uh, you've just uh, I, I know under your previous pastor, every every month was a new initiative, it seemed, of just doing good. Uh, I know we've certainly here at Liberty, we seek to do community good through the church. Um, how do we speak to this? I, I, honestly, I also think that uh, I have two boys now, you know, and, and change is going to really happen if, if through us doing church and community good, the next generation is raised up in a world, I would hope, where racism would finally be gone. Uh, talk about this. I, I know one of the issues is always the lack of commitment, mm -hmm. you know, in the church and in the community. So speak to that. Doing good in your church, doing good through your community the real need? Well, first I would say, as, as, as you were saying about the uh, uh, home, family, yeah. um, I think that uh, those of us who have kids, who raise kids, uh, know that the kids, they're watching, mm -hmm. looking at you. And so if they see mommy or daddy do things at times when they don't want to do it, but they are committed to doing it, that's leading by example. You're modeling that in front of your kids. And so as they get older and then they are in the communities or they are in the church, then they have a foundation to come off of because they've seen what commitment really looked like. So now when we're in the church, commitment it's not just a one-time thing. You do something and you do it for a season, for a period of time. Commitment is for the long haul. It's not something that, you know, for next week, for next month, for next year. It is continual and it is hard. You know, it, and, and you have to realize for those of us that are, are the church that we cannot get godly kingdom building foundation within the within the our our uh, community without the commitment, meaning you cannot accomplish nor achieve what needs to be done in your own power or in your own strength. And that has to, be, has to come from God. Because at times I have um, been weak, I have been weary, but my commitment to whatever that was made me get up and the love, right along with the love made me get up and go out and do. And so that's what committed, it's, it's, not, it's not easy, it's not an easy thing, it's a hard thing, but it's something that has to be done if we want to see the results that we want to see in the earth. I'll tell you one thing that I'm hopeful will happen. There's a lot of energy right now, right now a lot of energy. I am hopeful that that energy is harnessed to be to to overflow some of the justice and mercy ministries of our churches. All that energy, I'd also love to see additional nonprofits yes. develop yes. in this time to take all this energy, turn it into day-to-day -day commitment, and for us to see uh, ministries flourish. Certain nonprofits flourish to see local church and community good flourish in a way it's never flourished before. Right. And that would be a wonderful conclusion that we would actually put some things in place so that the world really, really, really would be a different, a different place. And not just the world would be a different place. I can't speak to the world. I can't even speak to Virginia. I just, I just live on one little tiny place on planet Earth and it happens to be called Appomattox. So I just like to see this place 
uh, be a better place. A better place. And uh, I think if we take all this energy and do that and commit to our families, commit to our churches, commit to good community organizations. By the way, I, I, I want to pray. I know across the board, not just in our churches, but all of our civic organizations, all of them, almost everyone I know about, you know, in our, one of the longstanding ones, mm -hmm. okay, so maybe I don't want to overspeak. They're all desperate for volunteers. The volunteers are getting older, and they're, they're, they're hoping for a new generation. Maybe those institutions, those things need to be reworked, but we need a fresh push of ministry and local commitment to the things that make churches and communities strong. I'll pray us out, Robert. I can't, I know we're supposed to be socially distancing, but I'm gonna <laughs> shake your hand today and uh, thank you for your time. This is just the start. That's right. Uh, and it's not a start because we've already had started, but we're just going to continue to journey together. Uh, let us, let me pray us out. Heavenly Father, we pray for a local commitment to good works. And God, we pray for strong commitment to the ministries of our churches, strong commitment to the organizations in our community that make a community strong and good places to live. Uh, God, we pray that your church uh, not just in its worship, but also in its action, that they would see our good deeds and glorify you who are in heaven, that we would be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. We would be a city on a hill, that we wouldn't take our light and put it under a basket, but that we would exhibit qualities of the heart that move to expressions of the hands and feet God, we pray for better days. We pray for uh, peace. We pray for justice. We pray for this moment to not, to not end in a negative way, but God, to end in a positive way. God, that we would see a fresh commitment in the areas of life that will bring real, lasting healing and flourishing. That's what we ask in Jesus' name, amen.